Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts That's what we say, uh, Sue Plumtree, as being a little saucy. I love your name because it's so fruity. <laughs> <laughs> it is wonderful to have Indeed. you here on the edge with me, Brains. We've got a guest on the edge, right? She's got it. This is the place <laughs> where the conversation is pointed. The guests are sharp and the responses are never dull. Sue Plumtree is here with us today, and we're going to have a beautiful conversation. She is a woman. Can I tell your age? 76, darling. She is 76 years (laughs) old. And isn't she gorgeous? She's happy. And she just got married about a year ago. We're going to talk about that. And then she was previously married about 37 years. So I want to talk to her about how to sustain a relationship. She's a relationship coach. She's the author of what, 2.5 books? I call it ebook a 0.5. <laughs> We're going to talk about all that and more today here on the Edge. Brains, help me welcome my guest right there, Sue Plumtree. Hi, baby. Hi, darling. Welcome to On the Edge. I'm so excited. I've been waiting for you. And I've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said, too. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here. Um, You know, you are a a beautiful woman. You're a seasoned woman. You still have, as we call it, swagger, and you are stunning. You're still sexy, (laughs) vibrant. You just fell in love and and got married again uh, at a a tender age. You know, that's 76 is not for chumps. Tell us a little bit about your story and where it all began from Barcelona, Spain. No, (laughs) Argentina, darling, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Argentina, okay, I got to get my South America right. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so there's uh, Buenos Aires and Argentina and Costa Rica, all of that is South America, right? No, give me my geography. Probably, probably somewhere, yeah. And beneath um, Brazil, next to Chile, down there. All right. Okay. All right. Well, take me down there with you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, um, I was born in Buenos Aires because my parents fled Prague just before the invasion of the Nazis. Mm. In those days, people scattered all over the world and they ended up, I'll tell you, my parents were adventurous. They landed in uh, Bolivia. They lived in the jungles, waiting to see how the war was going to pan out. Mm. Wow. And uh, that's when they decided to go to Buenos Aires. And uh, I was born in 1945. So actually, if you ask me about Argentina, I, I would say, I don't know, because my parents were, um, we spoke German at home from Vienna. I went to, to a German school in Buenos Aires. And my parents decided that I should be a secretary. And uh, in those days, people didn't speak foreign languages. So I came to England to learn English. The idea was then to return to Buenos Aires and become highly desirable on the job market. Instead of which, I met Bill. In my book, I call him Jim. So I'm going to refer to him as Jim. Okay. I met him three months after I arrived in England. I went to a concert. I arrived early. Mm. I wanted uh, to choose a good place. Mm. Turned out the place was completely empty, except for this one man. Oh. And he was sent and sitting right bang in the middle of the room. Mm. I took a look at him. I liked his dimples. 
So I decided to go and I sat right next to him. Now, can you imagine, this is England, all the social taboos I broke by, there's a whole empty room, I go and sit next to him. And I engaged him in conversation. And the poor man just didn't know how to defend himself <laughs> against me. <laughs> and I tell you, right there and then, I decided to see if I could make him fall in love with me. Wow. I made some serious decisions that colored the rest of my life. The first one was that unfortunately I did succeed and we did get married just four months after we met. Mm. And the reason we did that was because my work permit was due to run out and it had to be done before. The other decision that I made that sounds funny, but isn't, was, now we are talking 1965, okay? The swinging 60s. Yeah, that's what I was saying, free love, hippies, LSD. Well, <laughs> I come from Buenos Aires and I knew nothing about that. It meant nothing. Mm -hmm. So I looked at him and as I said, I liked the looks of him, but I judged his hair to be too long. It just went, just out there to the top of his sh shirt collar. Mm. And I decided that if I got to know him better, I would get him to have his hair cut. Now, it sounds funny, but it was the first decision I made about changing him. Mm. I judged him even then, and I kept judging him pretty much for the rest of our marriage, one way or the other. Looking back, I imagine it was really difficult to be at the receiving end of me, actually. Okay. But I believed he was to blame for my unhappiness and for the eventual breakdown of my marriage. Now, to be fair, he had what you call aspersions. Mm -hmm. So he had a total lack of social empathy, skills, or anything. So it was very, very lonely. I felt taken for granted, unhappy, unloved. But it took me some years after I left my marriage to realize that I too contributed to the breakdown and my own unhappiness. Now, the importance of that is, as painful as that insight was, it was liberating because you can only change yourself. Absolutely. And that was the biggest lesson that changed my life. Wow. And you know what? Bravo, because you owned it. And oh, yes. So many people, they, they won't own it, you know? That is and, a hard bit. And when you get in a relationship, you want to come in equally yoked, spiritually, financially, holistically, physically. It just doesn't work that way. Because if you've had any life experience, Say you get married in your 30s, you may have children, you may have bad credit, you may have alcohol problems, you may have been unemployed. Everybody's going to come with some baggage. And what we have to learn to deal with is how much are we willing to accept, but also how much baggage do we bring with us into a relationship? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. It's not, it's not easy. And then once you get in it, and if you're big enough to accept it, how do you work through those things? So you became a relationship coach. And then I'm going to go into your second marriage because I want to know what you've learned from that. But in the interim, why did you become a relationship coach? Because I was coached myself for a very long time. And I realized the power of coaching. Yes. Um, the name of my life coach was Alan, and he transformed my life. Every single area, work, friendships, love, my relationship with myself. Wow. And that's why I decided to become a coach myself, because in some way I wanted to give back. Right, right. That was so the main one reason. Of the that, 
what are some of the concrete things that Alan taught you about you? The first thing I learned working with him was how I was obsessed with my self-image, mm. how I wanted people to see me. I was um, hiding behind masks of um, how I was a people pleaser. I didn't realize I was, but that's what I did realized that I would do whatever it took to get people to like me. And I remembered, thanks to him, that my parents told me that I should do whatever it takes to get people to like and accept me because they believed that my survival depended on it. And it did. It and did. it did, like but it did more for them escaping the Nazis, hiding in the jungle. They depended on their, um, goodwill of people for their own lives. Right. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, by the time I was growing up, that was no longer really appropriate. So I never really trusted myself. Mm. So learning to actually like myself was a huge journey. It took me such a long time. Yeah. The good news is that when I work with clients, they don't have to work as long as I did. Right. They can benefit from my own experience. Well, you know, and but Jim got the brunt of it. <laughs> he did. But what you didn't like or you found about yourself, you ridiculed and condemned him for what he did. So um, did he ever discuss that with you? Did he ever discuss with you how he was feeling? about himself? Did he have low self-esteem or anything? Oh, sorry, I have to laugh. He didn't talk. He was reserved. It's probably not even the right word. Absolutely, the answer is no, never. I went into denial in my marriage and I like to pretend that everything was fine because I couldn't handle the truth. But the pain had to go somewhere and it went into my body. And so I developed all kinds of conditions from, I don't know how many episodes of clinical depression to severe pains that were completely random. And on one occasion, I ended up walking on crutches that could not be identified by the medical profession. And the worst was I became bulimic. So I became uh, a comfort eater and I became really, really big. And then I went into bulimia and I made myself vom vomit. And I obviously, I was sent for therapy. And I believe that I'm alive today because I just sim simply didn't want to die because bulimia can be fatal potentially. Oh God, I can imagine. I, mm. was watching, I was watching the Netflix series, The, uh, the Crown. And wow, Princess Diana, Indeed. I've never seen that before. See, in the African American community, we eat up the whole damn refrigerator. We ain't gonna throw it up. We'll eat it up. Look at me. Look at you know. I've been going through some stress right now, and I'm <laughs> I'm not throwing up that steak and those French fries. No, I'm not doing it. So we take on a different thing. So when you are in, and I don't want to go into this too deep. And again, I want to be sensitive to people that are experiencing and going through an eating disorder of any kind. But when you were going through that, did you feel that you were like unworthy or that you didn't look good or you were trying to please other people? Can you give me a snapshot of what was running through your brain? I believed it was a question of control. Mm. Specifically, I couldn't control any part of my life, but I could control my body. So on the one hand, I was seriously stuffing my face and then I purged myself. So I totally controlled at least that small part of my life. Wow, wow. And this is the, what I discovered. I discovered the, the connection between the quality of my relationship and the quality of my health. So today at 76, I have none of the conditions that people my age group have. I am the healthiest and happiest 
that have ever been. So that is the connection. Wow. So <clears throat> you moved into coaching. Now, did you said you were in a lot of therapies. What was the difference between talk therapy or clinical therapy and being coached? Because when you started with a coach, it seems like it just flipped the switch. Something different happened. What was that? Oh, yes. The, the therapy was specifically to help me deal with the bulimia. So it was a very small, short period of time. The coaching, I've been coached for years. And the reason I kept continuing being coached is because there's always more. And I climb one mountain, then there's another one, and then another one. So I can't stop growing and learning. Um, and Alan was um, absolutely key to my growth. Now, of course, I don't need him anymore. So we stopped coaching. But it was um, a huge experience, huge. Yeah. It's very and powerful. Like, and I like how you say that, is that you don't need him anymore. A lot of times people will go through therapy. Yes. You know, and they've lived a certain situation for 20 years and then they're in therapy for another 12 years. It's like they never move beyond that situation. Mm. Or someone is with a coach, you know, if I'm coaching with someone, I want to be able to outgrow them. I want to exactly. go to someone else's new experience. I want someone else to pour something uh, different into me. And I want to be able to walk away with something. I don't want somebody to hold my hand the entire time. I want to learn how to cross the street by myself. Absolutely. And that is my intention for you to become independent of me. That's beautiful. But that may take absolute minimum of um, six months, maybe maximum 12 months. But some clients keep coming back to me for because life keeps happening. Absolutely. Mm. And it's always good to check in and tune up. You can't put a timetable on change. If Absolutely you put not. A timetable on change, you could have put a timetable on destruction and, and disease and pain and sorrow. You know, mm. it, at its appointed time. That's what we say in the Bible and the Christian. It is at God's appointed time. You know, I completely agree. So you were a caregiver and I was a caregiver. You get, you cared for your mom and I cared for my mom. Um, and there was a lot that we both learned from those experiences. Share with me one of your greatest memories uh, that, you know, being able to take care of your mom, what was one of the greatest joys? Oh. One of the hard bits was that she lived in a different part of the country from me, very, quite far. But one day, she always used to cook my childhood preferred dishes. She was a magnificent cook. Mm. And one day she said, I don't want to cook anymore. And I said, okay, I will. So prior to visiting her, I would prepare dishes for the whole weekend, freeze them, and they were gradually defrosting across in my visit to when I got there. And I, I fed her. I loved the cooking. I liked the look, looking after her for that small period of time. Uh, that was such huge, huge joy. And she was my very best friend. Oh. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2009, she was the one I, I would phone after every treatment. And, uh, and she never interfered with my decision about which treatment to go for, mm. which was such a, a joy because the decision was mine and she didn't put me under any pressure. Right, she supported you. Totally. And so she was my very best friend. Oh. When she was fully in dementia and we, she was in a home only for about three months maximum before she died, she was 94. She forgot about everything except me. That was the wonderful memory. I am um, the last visit a week before she died. I sang to her. So I leaned towards her 
and I sang the lullaby that she used to sing to me when I was a baby. Then I moved back and I looked at her. She smiled and she said, you are crazy. <laughs> well, I have a similar story about my mom. My really? mom loves corn, okra, and tomatoes mixed together. I hated that. <laughs> and she would say, baby, I made some greens. Are you going to have some corn, okra, and tomato with me? And I was like, no. Come on, put a little bit on your plate. No, huh? no, no. Well, yesterday was Mother's Day and she passed away. And you know what I had for the first time in my life? Corn, okra, and tomato. <laughs> oh, and was, sweetie. And it was delicious. Oh. It was delicious. It just laid on my tongue. And we had a similar thing that we used to do. We used to say our prayers at night together. Now I lay me down to sleep. And she would be like a little child. And I say, okay, who are we going to bless? And she'd tell me who she's going to bless. And I'd start out the prayer and she'd end it up. And, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to share in those memories. And Indeed. I would ask her because she had a little bit of dementia. It would kick in sometimes more than others. Uh, but I said, do you know who I am? She said, I will never forget who you are. Sweetie. So it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It is. We have another synergy. We have both been uh, married. You were married your first time, 37 years. I mean, 30, what, 37 yeah, years? Yeah, 37. Yeah. I've been married 37 years this year in June. Okay. Now, that marriage didn't work out the way that you wanted, but how were you able to sustain 37 years with one person? Well, that was easy. I went into denial. <laughs> I pretended everything was fine. And I certainly presented the image of a happy couple. Wow. And even I didn't know the depths of my unhappiness, but my body knew. My body did know. Mm. Did you have children? No. Um, I think all my clients are my children in some ways. They are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have so much to teach them. Now, I so do. You found love again. Oh, yes. And, and you got married. Tell me all about that, girlfriend. Oh, sweetie, I can't wait to tell you. Okay. <laughs> After I left my marriage, I lived on my own for 10 years. And I was amazed how much I enjoyed it. I liked my own company. And I started attracting wonderful friendships. And one day, I, I was wondering, how is it possible? I went on a three-day course, and it was called Spiritual Renewal. I had been trying to forgive Jim for my unhappiness, and I couldn't. I tried this technique, I tried that technique, and I just, I was so filled with pain and rage, I, could, I couldn't let go. So I go on this course, and one of the things that they, the course leader did was she would call somebody from the audience, put them in the hot seat, give them a folded piece of paper. And she said that that piece of paper was meant specifically for us. So when it was my turn, I opened that piece of paper and it said, embrace forgiveness. Wow. And I went, oh, no, I can't do this. And I went and I talked and I talked and I talked and I talked with my eyes closed and crying. Did you say, oh, no. <laughs> and then she said, forgiveness is not a, an individual thing, but it's a human thing. So go back to your seat and we'll do a forgiveness meditation. And it was about surrendering our pain to God. Hmm. And I knew it wasn't going to work. So, so she said, who do you want to forgive? And I was going to say Jim, but instead I said me. Wow. I didn't expect that. And then she said, up, what part of you? And I said, the part of me who believed I was unworthy of love. And I thought, where did that come from? And then I thought about my marriage. I thought about my friendships. You know, they were lukewarm. 
And I knew it's true. I didn't believe I was worthy of love. So we did that meditation. And at the end of which I was just smiling. And I thought, what is it going to be like when I go home and, and I look at Jim? And for the first time in about a year since I told him I was going to leave him, oh, wow. I looked at him with soft eyes and tenderness. Mm. And it healed us both. It healed us both. Wow. So, um, and then when I started attracting all these fabulous friendships, I wanted to understand how that was possible with my history. Mm. Have you heard of a woman called Brene Brown? Yes. She, I watched a TED talk, Vulnerability. Mm. And I understood for the first time why I was attracting these wonderful people. And this is something I teach now because this is how I live my life. And it is, you make yourself emotionally vulnerable. Mm. You know, the good, the bad, the indifferent. I have nothing to prove anymore. And that is one of the things that I learned from working with Alan. Because I was hiding and pretending that I was, you know, all this wonderful person. I, I was loving, I was supportive. I was all these wonderful things. And you are to blame if something goes wrong. Wow. And then I realized it was me. But how did you attract number two? You made all these wonderful connections. Were you a little afraid and were you a little apprehensive? Not in the least because I knew I was never going to uh, find love again. Oh. I was too old. So I started going on adventures. And in November, 2015, I went on an adventure, a paragliding holiday in Turkey. Airgliding? It was wow. amazing, <laughs> joyful. So if you if you go, April, if you go to my website, okay. on the homepage, you have a picture of me paragliding. I saw it. And you know what? That is something I want to do. There's a beautiful uh, hangar uh, port here in San Diego, right over the cliffs. I don't want to jump out of an airplane, but I do no. want a parasail. I do want to do it in tandem, it's, of course. It's incredible. It's glorious. Okay, you feel like a bird? You, oh, I can't oh. I'm excited. There's nothing like it. So I was happy, fulfilled. I thought I had everything. Great friendships, adventures, work I'm passionate about. And then two weeks after, I, I have to tell you, that I volunteer as a group leader in an organization in England called the University of the Third Age. And I ran a program called the Life Enhancing Group. And one day I thought it would be fun to have a new group. And I called it, come lunch with me. Because I love cooking. And Dave was one of the people who phoned. Oh no, Dave. And, uh, and, did you, and did you do the same thing? Did you ambush him <laughs> and sit there and make him talk to you? Because you know that's your MO. <laughs> not anymore. Not, not anymore. anymore. That's a great thing. Uh, that's one of the things that I learned about. And I remember, I'll tell you, one of the one of the things that I used to do was I, I would ask loads of questions because I understood that men like to talk about themselves. Yeah. So I did the same with Dave. And then he said, I know what you're doing. You're asking me all these questions to deflect attention from yourself. Oh. And then he asked me a question. I don't remember what the question was, but do you know how that women communicate differently than you do with a man? Mm -hmm. With a woman, you go deeper. You just cut the crap and just go for the truth but not with men. No. But on that moment, I had a choice to make. And I answered the question as if he had been a woman, authentically, truthfully. Mm. And he went away and thought about what I said. Next time we met, 
he said, I thought about it and came up with other questions. And so we started from being truthful with one another. Mm. Even though- what a, what a novel idea, starting with the truth, Brains. <laughs> Isn't it? No, you're absolutely well, right. You know, because what happens, Sue, is when people are dating nowadays, they introduce you to their representative. You know, oh, here's this person, you know, this is who I aspire to be. This is the job I wish I had. These are the breasts I thought I had, you know, this is the, you know, the eyelashes or whatever mm. the situation may be. It is your representative. It is not the person that is authentic. Or they come in and they bring the baggage from the other yeah. relationship. They yeah. want to talk about how unhappy they were with Jim. Or they want to talk about, <laughs> I mean, you know, those kind of situations. That's not a way to attract a new love or to attract a new interest. You've got to come vulnerable. You've got to come pretty much you know, a little bit transparent so that they can see who you are to see if they connect with you. And you can tell right away. I mean, you know, the signs and symptoms of nonsense or things that you just won't tolerate. You can hear it. You can see it. And I hear women say all the time, I was drawn to the same type of man. I was drawn to the same type of personality. Well, baby, it's probably because you was putting out that same kind of energy. Mm, I agree with you. But I tell you something about two or three years after I left my marriage, I went on a course about, basically it was about how to get ready for a relationship. Mm. And it was all about me. And I learned how to recognize the right person in the first couple of weeks mm. before you commit yourself to the relationship. And it's all about knowing yourself, what you need to thrive and to feel loved in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And what, how to find out if the person you're interested in will fit in with your needs. Mm -hmm. right. And you can find out very early on. Most people believe that by the time you figure it out, it's too late. And I can show people how to do it. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you think about sex on the first date? <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think so either. I don't think so. And I will tell you why. Often women believe that that, that is a way to speed up intimacy. And that is a shortcut that will never work. Or very rarely, you know, because... <laughs> People being what they are, you never know. But I don't think you can do that. Also, I believe that lovemaking is more than just in the bedroom. Lovemaking happens outside of the bedroom. Absolutely. And that is another something that I teach people about how to build long lasting, solid, loving relationships. Okay, what do you think about this? This online dating. You were married a long time. I've been married a long time. I don't have a clue. I've never even been on one of these sites. I'm afraid of them, actually. But I know people that have gotten married, that have found great partners and great relationships. What would you say? And something else that happens. I had a woman, a guest on my show, that get catfished, where they are manipulated. She was catfished out of $400,000. Yes. They got her for almost a half a million dollars because she was emotionally tender and vulnerable and she fell into that trap. What would you say to a person that is of a particular age that's looking for love, that's online dating? Okay, where do I start? First of all, I had a similar experience where I had a great time with this guy, never saw him, turned out he then asked me for money and I let him go instantly. But then I thought that other women might give money because they thought they might be the last chance. Online dating, I'm actually more, I'm skeptical and I will tell you why. The only thing you have in common is A, um, 
that you're looking for a partner. That's it. The rest of it is whatever they choose to write on their profile. So the reason I told you earlier that I knew I was never going to find love because I was too old is because all the men, all the men, whatever their age, were always looking for younger women. Mm. So and that's when I- for what? You know, if they're like in their seventies, you better hope you can still perform, you know? Because like, <laughs> well, really, because a younger woman, she just want a sugar daddy. She wants somebody that's gonna take her out and spend money on her and let her run wild. But when it comes to truth now, and I can't say all, but you know, I I know I see people all the time, and so they're looking for they're looking for love in all the wrong places. I agree. You know where it all starts, and that is what my work is founded on: it's your relationship with yourself. Most women, most people, don't really know themselves. They don't like themselves, which means they make poor choices that lead them to poor places. Right. right. So that is my work, getting people to really like themselves, trust themselves, respect themselves. Right. Well, you wrote that in the pages of some books. Do you have your books there? Like I my so do. Books. Okay. This is my latest book. Oh, I poured my heart and soul in, into this book. It's available on Amazon, by the way. And I wrote all the mistakes. I like to talk about my mistakes mm -hmm. and what I learned from them. Um, and um, what I, Dave is in this book, what I learned about love and how to build it, why my relationship broke down, my first marriage. It's all there. The other one, which I published in 2008 is my autobiography and it's my journey. And I wrote it because I wanted to tell people, you don't have to stay in this painful place. There is another way to live. So those are my favorite books. Those are the best. Tell my brains how to get in contact with you, Sue Plumtree. I want them to connect with you. And you know what? For Nothing else but the fact of her generational wisdom. You know, she had to flee with her family from the Nazis. She had to uh, learn to assimilate and acculturate into a, a country where they didn't speak multi-languages. She had to go to another country to learn to speak the language to get a decent job. Then she falls in love with a stranger. She's the only one in the room with him. And she finds out more about herself. And then from there, she just blossoms like a lotus flower. And she frees herself. And here she is now on the edge. Now, if that is not wisdom that you can grow from, learn from, and be nurtured by, I don't know if you're ready. I'm ready. Tell them how to get in contact with you, Sue. Well, two ways. LinkedIn, Sue Plumtree, LinkedIn is probably the best. Or my website, it's www.sueplumtree.com. Well, Brains, we are gonna put that down there on the bottom. We are gonna run that. I want you to go and get the book. I can just imagine, you should do that book in audio. That voice inflection is beautiful. And do it in different languages too, so other women around the world can get uh, to get a taste of what's going on. I'm so happy for you. And I'm glad that you are here with me on the edge. Please come back. So am I, darling. <laughs> and, and, and be my friend, because I really appreciate that. You know, I love generational wisdom. I love it when you've been through there and you stop the generational trauma, that you've been able to accept it, move mm. forward, and now pour it into somebody else. Thank you so much for being here on the edge. It was wonderful being with you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Okay, Brains. You know what you got to do. You got to go and subscribe to everything. You got to listen to Sue and all the other edgy conversations. YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. That's where our tribe lives. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Be good to yourself, Sue. I will. You too, darling. I will. Bye, Brain. Bye.